So hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to our conversation about the new world Chief Information Security Officer as we gear towards 2025. I'm Daniela Palmata, I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing for SAI, and I'm excited to facilitate this conversation today. I'll start with a few words about SAI and introduce our distinguished panel right here with me. Uh, just before we dive right into the conversation. So SAI is a cyber risk quantification provider, and we serve over 200 organizations. Or in simple words, our platform puts a dollar number on cyber risk and exposure. Essentially, it visualizes the most likely attack vectors to customers' business assets, and we offer guidance on risk mitigation based on our customers' most uh, critical business assets and their business context. So essentially, our customers use our platform to prioritize their risk management investments across the company, develop their cybersecurity maturity, and also comply with rules and regulations. So the topics we will discuss today with uh, this distinguished panel here that I'll introduce in a minute is really three main topics. How do the recent regulations and rules um, are driving boards to be much more accountable for cybersecurity? And what are the skills and requirements that are defining the new world chief information security officer? And from now on, I'll say CISO uh, for that. And lastly, we'll end with some valuable tips and tools uh, for the new world CISO as we enter 2025. So without further ado, I'm really happy to introduce this distinguished panel. Um, so first of all, I'm very uh, privileged to have here Tim Brown. Uh, Tim Brown is a cybersecurity veteran with over 25 years of experience and the Chief Information Security Officer and VP of Security of SolarWinds. Tim has been at the forefront of designing, implementing and managing security programs for some of the most complex environments, leading initiatives that enhance resilience and mitigate risk at all levels. His expertise covers a wide spectrum from threat intelligence and network defense to vulnerability management and incident response. Tim's dedication to advancing the field and helping organizations stay secure in an evolving landscape makes him an invaluable force in cybersecurity and our uh, panel member here with us today. Uh, we're also honored uh, to welcome Sophia Herrera to our session here today. Sophia is the managing partner at Omnion Legal, a law firm specializing in cybersecurity, data privacy, and data government. And so she brings a legal perspective to our conversation. As a California Bard attorney and former global CISO and CPO for technology startups and an international EV um, OEM, she uniquely blends technological innovation, cybersecurity expertise, and legal regulatory insight. Sophia is also the author of The Founder, The Candidate, and The Biometric Gamble, a cybersecurity and privacy fable series. Passionate about bridging the gap between technology and law, she helps businesses protect their information assets and navigate today's complex regulatory environment to drive business value. And finally, we're thrilled to welcome our, our, our own Ira Winkler, uh, the SAI's Field Chief Information Security Officer and Vice President of SAI. Ira is globally recognized um, as a cybersecurity expert and has been called the modern day James Bond of cybersecurity. He has spent his career performing espionage simulations and leading risk management for some of the world's largest organizations. With decades of experience, Ira has authored several bestsellers, including You Can Stop Stupid and Security Awareness for Dummies. So, Welcome, Tim, Sophia, and Ira. Really honored to have you here on this conversation. So let's start with you know, a very first question. If you move to the next slide, 
we see here a host of new regulations, uh, new rules that have come across uh, and have been introduced in 2023 and, and throughout the past year in 2024 across, you know, all over the globe. And so how do you think uh, CISO accountability will be different in 2025? especially as many of those, of those regulations are, uh, some of them are also coming into effect in 2025. And in light of some of the developments we've seen with some of those uh, rules and regulations uh, coming into effect in, in the past year. So I think we can, uh, you know, start maybe with Sophia. Uh, if you can bring your uh, perspective First of all, you know, from your even from your legal perspective of those regulations and uh, what does that mean to the CISO? Certainly. So what we're starting to see here in cybersecurity is an alignment of the CISO closer to a CFO. So in the way that CFOs have to report directly to the board with SOX and what that reporting looks like, we're starting to see that same reporting for CISOs. Um, and it's not just happening in the U.S., it's also happening in Europe and then in Asia as well. They are following Europe's lead, specifically the EU. Um, and from there, it creates an opportunity for CISOs to really get in and to explain to boards what accountability measures that they need to be aware of, how they can bridge that gap and where they go from there together instead of as adversaries. Interesting. Ira, would you like to weigh in here as well? So it's kind of, I look at it from, like Sophia describes it from like the formal legal is issues. I look at it from more of a pragmatic, practical issue. What's going to happen? Now, the one good thing about the SEC rules, and Tim probably has good or bad things to say about them as well, but it kind of means that cybersecurity at least has to be taken seriously. The issue for most organizations that you have to understand is that in really mature, large organizations like I've been at in the past, Cybersecurity programs are well-respected, well-resourced. They are given the proper attention with the board and so on. But then you have the bulk of companies where it's hit or miss, depending on whether or not the company values the CISO and cybersecurity. You know, usually, usually, you know, uh, sorry, I can name an, uh, a Fortune 10 incident recently that I will not, but usually the better respected organizations have well-established proven CISOs who know how to go ahead and deal with incidents, who can present to board and things like that. But then you have other organizations that tend to be hit or miss or the respect the CISO is given, the prominence the CISO is given, how well they fund the cyber security effort. And what's at least going to happen here is that with the new SEC regulations, these are not the panacea people think they are. It's a very, in my opinion, basic. It establishes some rules and regulations regarding reporting. It says you have to disclose cybersecurity expertise of the board. It doesn't say there has to be expertise on the board, which is a critical distinction. And so what we really need to understand is it's going to be make what might be a should in most organizations, because I have my concept of shoulds and musts. Most people think security should be important. It's the organizations that think security must be important where it is. Now, this is going to change it from a bit of a should or a should in many organizations to a bit of a must consider. Not a must be secure, but at least a must consider. And that hopefully will give CISO some better things to go to the board with. If you're a public CISO and you don't have DNO insurance, you don't have the mandates, you need to make sure you're documenting everything you say and keep a record of everything you say to the board. That's what this is going to be because I'm more concerned of 
possible personal accountability for the CISO than I am for the organization, which frankly, really at the end of the day, just has to say we kind of thought about security a little bit, but not that we did anything about security. So I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, yeah. And Tim, would you like to also weigh in on? Um, yep. Yeah, absolutely. So when you think about where we are, we're simply in the maturity phase, right? So remember, cyber is pretty young, right? What, 30, 40 years tops. So when you look at finance, hundreds of years. So the structure, we're just maturing as a, as a space. Um, and, you know, with maturity comes more controls, comes more um, expectation, comes more rules. And you know, I think when you look at the rules, essentially, today being disclosure rules, you know, potentially tomorrow more process rules so on what the expectations are. So I don't think, you know, as, as, but we shouldn't see this as a, you know, something that we avoid. It's simply a maturing of our, our practices. Um, it's a maturing of what the expectations are. Uh, it's a maturing as a way for us to reach to, yeah, you know, a better level of security or better understanding of risk, I should say, for, um, you know, for companies. And that's what we hope to have from kind of this wave of, of, of regulations that we see. It's at the end of the day, when we look at there, have we gotten better? Have we been able to manage risk better? Have we had more processes and procedures in the right way? Do we, because we can't, you know, there's no way to guarantee that you're not going to have something happen. We're just, yeah, our adversaries are getting better and better and better and more sophisticated and more sophisticated. But we can do a better job on yeah, the transparency side of the world. Yeah, so so it's interesting. Sophia started with, you know, comparing the CISO to more like a CFO, very mature role in the executive leadership. Ira talked about uh, the should and the must. And, you know, how we're getting into more from should, but actually what are the things that we must have and and must report on? And Tim, you actually refer to, to the maturity, uh, to the growing maturity. And if we look specifically also, you know, at the SEC rules uh, that IRS started touching upon as well, and if we dive deeper into uh, the SEC rules introduced last year, we see that they, uh, you know, they, they guide for uh, greater transparency and, and consistency on the one hand for public companies to disclose um, and to share, to, to share the transparency with the investors and with, uh, with the market about the, the risk. Um, and that is supposed to help uh, the investors in the market also take um, you know, better decisions. But if we look at some of the also the challenges with uh, such new rules, and if we move on to the next slide, this is where we share the you know the specific um, uh, headlines that the SEC rules have uh, have garnered in the, in the past year. Tim, maybe you can elaborate a bit on you know how that um, the those new SEC rules have on the one hand created opportunities. On the other hand, um, have also created a few challenges for uh, those CISOs of those public companies. Yeah, so a few things. Um, there's only so much I can uh, I can talk about some of these things with uh, ongoing things that are happening. But you know, in general, if we look at what's happened in the last few years, right, the CISO position has definitely been elevated some. I think in general, I think that the um, I think that we do see cybersecurity conversations happening at the board much more. So if we look at the big picture, right, the effectiveness of some of the rules, just then uh, whatever the rules say is less important that the rules are in place. 
right? Just the fact that rules are there has spurred more activity from a public company perspective and more attention. Now, you know, is it perfect? No. Was Sarbanes actually perfect to start with from a CFO perspective? No. Um, it, it, I think it will take a number of iterations to get better. Um, and, and, and subtleties associated with it. So um, I think this one's just going to take us time. And when we look at maturity, we're just in a transitional period. And um, But that transitional period um, and the, the rules that have been placed have, have you know, definitely you know, helped move the world forward. Um, and for public companies to today, world tomorrow from a global perspective of rules. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Ira, would you like to also add? You touched a bit about on it. Before. Yeah, so what I look at in the SEC rules, there have been a few. I'll just talk about a couple of interesting twists. Mm-hmm. One interesting twist was that the, one of the key things about SEC rules regards disclosure of incidents. Right. And it's disclosure of specifically material incidents which is such a vague term according to SEC rules. It's something to the effect that a a, a typical investor might make a different investment decision based upon knowing the fact. That's Mm -hmm. kind of where it is. So if, if my mother decides, you know what, for my ret- IRA retirement account or whatever, if I, I might have made a different decision, some class action attorney could crawl out of the sewer and somehow claim, you know, a disclosure didn't happen. Now, the reason I bring this up is what a lot of companies have done is they've started issuing 8Ks almost for the hell of it. And it's sort of like what they've done is they say, well, we had an incident. It's not a material incident, but we're going to report it anyway. And in many ways, that's a, you know, cover your behind type of thing, because this way you could say, look, we gave information as we had. Maybe things changed a little bit after that. We found out new information, but we at least disclosed the concept of this as early as possible. But what this also has an impact in doing is that it kind of dilutes an actual material incident as well. Because when everything's reported, you know, when everything's reportable, nothing's reportable. It's kind of like the old saying, when when everyone's in charge, nobody's in charge. And when you have all these different 8Ks coming in, a real 8K, like a really, a real incident is probably going to get lost in the crowd unless it's a really, really, really big incident in general. Like a crowd strike obviously was a major incident. But you have a lot of other incidents where things happen and they are reportable, but they get lost with all the non-reportable stuff. So that's number one. The other thing that concerned me was when a ransomware purveyor, and the irony is this was before the law actually came into effect, Some ransomware or extortionware purveyor was basically extorting a company even more by saying, if you don't pay us, we are going to report this incident to the SEC. And so therefore, the SEC is almost going to be, unless they address this well, is going to be used as a criminal enforcer where companies might have to pay the criminal just because the criminal might say, hey, you know, I stole your information. If you don't give me money, I'm going to report you to the SEC. And they've got to account for that because, yes, we need rules, but there's got to be something that actually prevents criminals from using a law for their own benefit. So Mm -hmm. I'll just put that there because, again, right now we're seeing some basic issues that happen. You know, we really got to look at the side issues on what's going on here. Like, what are the implications of the laws in practice? And they really need to work some of these things out. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's clear. And and I think this is also, you know, a good question for you, Sophia, to understand if we if we drill into those skills and requirements that CISOs now are required to 
to adhere to with such rules. Um, and if we look at, you know, what Ira just said that, you know, people just report things just for the sake of reporting um, without necessarily, you know, um, making sure that it is a material versus non-material incident. What is your advice to CISOs? What, what skills and requirements would you emphasize um, to CISOs when, you know, when they come to you to consult around those uh, reporting needs? So my number one skill that I always say right off the bat is communication and collaboration. CISOs aren't expected to be the best at everything. They're not expected to be legal experts on top of technical experts, on top of cybersecurity experts, right? That is just not possible. But what you can work on is communicating with those within your organization or outsourcing to certain you know, legal uh, firms or consultants to provide you that expertise and to make sure that you're working with your team in a room on one page, one team. Because if you don't and you take it all upon yourself, going back to our previous slide, the CISO has all of the accountability and none of the resource. That's why we need to work together to make sure that we are bridging that gap with other departments and other teams. Yeah, it, it's very important that uh, you know no CISO should be making a decision on disclosing something, right? That's a that's a CFO, exec, board, um, general counsel type of uh, conversation and decision. Unless you know, in certain organizations, they may have that position, but most of the CISOs in today's world would not be responsible for that. They would sit in the room, sit on a disclosure committee, but the committee essentially is making decisions on disclosure, right? Because that's a, a very different skill that Sophia mentioned. Yeah, and, and if I could just add on to what Tim is saying, which is critical, the issue is, is that we're talking about the SEC and we're here talking about CISO responsibility but the reality is the new SEC rules are a requirement not of CISOs, but of the companies. Right. What's most important to remember, though, is that, and I hate to say it this way, but a CISO needs to understand how to cover their ass. And they need to understand what the differences are. They need to understand, for example, where their responsibilities are and where they stop. And they need to, again, if nothing else, do their personal due diligence in documenting just about everything that they go to the board. Like if they have a budget request, the budget request shouldn't be, hey, you know, I need a few extra million dollars. The budget request should be put in writing. You know, so this way, for example, if there is a critical incident and they say, oh, the CISO, the CISO was incompetent, it's like, look, I, did everything I could. I advised the board on the risk and I was right. It's not my job to say I told you so, but I did my job and I passed it on. The board then acted or didn't act upon my advice. And that is the best that we can do. Now, hopefully this is here for the purpose of, you know, letting CISOs know what are their responsibilities? What are the overall impacts so that they can make better decisions that they know potentially to hire, like in their contracts, say, hey, I want my own legal, private legal advisor as part of my contract. Mm -hmm. Because when they go ahead and submit documents, when they submit, well, without going into Tim's case, I mean, even when they are cr credited with putting things putting marketing, generic marketing garbage on a website, they need to make sure they are not held responsible for the marketing garbage on the website that the marketing team puts together and attributes to them. And these are a lot of these minor issues that we need to address going forward, or at least be aware of, because the SEC rules are for companies, not necessarily for people. 
but we as people need to understand how that might impact our liability, our personal liability in doing a job. But also mm -hmm. at the same time, I don't want to be, it's like me, me, me. At the same time, we want to be able to advise the company, hey, you guys are missing something critical, which would include bringing the lawyers in, making sure, I mean, because a lot of general counsels are reasonably intelligent, you know, a lot of them. And then, but the reality though is that they might not be aware of every aspect of the law. They might not be aware that if they are not familiar with the new SEC regulations or cybersecurity laws, that they need to bring in an outside counsel who supposedly specializes in that, at least if nothing else to cover their behinds. And the CISO should be bringing that together as well to help the other people under, I guess, as the saying goes, you want to know what you don't know. And a CISO yeah. should be helping people know what they don't know. So, and, and, and remember that the, the rules today say that you have to disclose, right? They don't say you have to have processes in place for those types of things, right? Right. We haven't reached that, again, that maturity curve for us to say that Hear what the hear what the, the roles and responsibilities are. Hear your audit behind it. So back again to the correlation to the CFO and Sarbanes Oxley in the U.S. Right? Mm -hmm. Again, before Sarbanes Oxley, you didn't have audit firms auditing right. per se, except for certain banking regulations. You didn't have it for everyone. So right. those gave us structure in order to say you're following the rules therefore yeah therefore everything that the the officers of the company are doing are not do not create personal liability do not create liability for the company as long as you're going through those correct processes um and it easier some way with accounting than it is with cyber but there are corollaries to you know what you can put into place yeah. And if you think of, um, you know, you talked a lot about the, the practical uh, needs and requirements, uh, documentation, processing, uh, or even the, the legal representation and, and consultation. I'd like to actually go back to also what Sophia said, which is around the communication and, and collaboration, which is a bit of a more of a soft skill, uh, soft skill set that we're seeing uh, requested more and more from uh, New World CISOs. And Tim, you actually were quoted in 2022 uh, when you asked about the solar winds incident and you said, and I, and I quote, I would have fired me if I hadn't had the right skills at the time. Uh, you said, well, can you, you know, elaborate a bit on that, what you meant? Yeah, so the, the day before an incident, the skills that you need, Right, running my program, trying to improve security as much as I can, doing all of those things. It's mm -hmm. very, very important. Uh, the day after an incident, such as yeah, such as the sunburst incident, you're getting countries calling you, and mm -hmm. they want to talk to the head of security. They want to talk to their their peer. You're getting the largest of the large corporations calling you. You're getting um, a number of people, some that just want to yell at you, some that want to help you get better, some that. So the skills that you need day after are very much knowledge, people, understanding, um, understanding where the business is, understanding how to translate what we have on our public information and the website, which is very good, but then be able to verbalize that. Right, to be able to not go astray with opinions on that verbalization. So to be able to you know, give people good answers, honest answers, transparent answers, without essentially going to the unknowns that you don't know. So very, very different skill set on the day after an incident. Um, hence the reason why I said that, is that if I didn't have those and those skills of communication, of talking, of all of those skills, and 
that's who you needed after a big incident. Now, we augmented me, so I had other people come in to help um, and those types of things. But when we say people up and knee jerk and just fire the CISO, it's not necessarily they fire them because they're doing a bad job or they did a bad job the day before, but they don't have the skills to manage through the day after and the next six, nine, four years um, after an incident. So nothing against the people, but when we when we take that reaction off and, oh, they just fired the CISO because they needed somebody to blame. It's not actually the case. Often it's they had to let the CISO go because they didn't have the skills for the day after a major incident. They had to bring in additional people to help or augment the team or do other things. Yeah, so, so this really makes a, um, you know, the distinction between the day before, the specific day of the incident itself, but also the day after. And I think this is... Uh, recovery is yeah. different too, and the skills you need for the recovery, right? And the skills you need to be exemplary after, right? Mm -hmm. Those, each one of them takes different, different skills. So, and some CISOs will um, really thrive in that, time afterwards, others may may not be able to um, do everything. Um, yeah, I, I think some of the skills that we do need to develop for the kind of the new world CISO is that both the linkage to the business, but also their communication skills, also their group skills, also their presentation skills, also their, you know, all of those things become you know, important for a number of reasons. There's corollaries back to the good times um, that will help them in good times, but really become very, you know, prevalent in, you know, crisis situation. Yeah, I would actually even uh, uh, look at it as uh, if Sophia talked about the CFO, it's about actually now also developing storytelling capabilities. So you're more like a CMO as well in a sense. So it's, I guess it's the expanding really the executive cap skill set of CISOs, um, which actually and leaves us all yeah. being a backroom CISO, right? You know, or right. just something that there's nothing wrong with being a backroom CISO to start with. Yeah. Right? You can, you're doing an incredibly effective job helping to secure the company, helping to understand risk, helping to do things in kind of the back room and very important needed skill as well. So I don't downplay that. It's simply that if something happens, then yeah, you need to have those other skills and it's great to be able to build those skills. So those same skills that you develop that you would use post incident are ones that you use when you're talking to your board, ones that you use when you're talking to your exec team, ones that you use in different ways. So it is really just preparing new set of skills for that kind of new world to so. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. So moving on to the expectations of, of boards and what is required also to report to the board of directors um, in light of those new regulations as well. And if I if I take also, um, you know, Tim's your analogy of like the, you know, the before, during the incident, they're, they're like two, two main contexts that we can think of during an incident and in routine. So what are, you know, how do you see the, the different type of reporting required uh, by the board? Moving on to the next, the next slide, what boards are really demanding and requesting from CISOs in uh, the time of an incident versus a time of routine? Uh, Sophia, would you like maybe to, to start with, with getting us into the board? Reporting? I'd love to. Okay, so we have two situations here. We have the routine, right? And we have the incident reporting. Uh, when we say routine, and I want to go back to what Ira was saying of the should and the must, I say that you should be every single time you report, whether that's quarterly, annually, whatever that looks like for the CISO, um, 
be having a gap analysis that measures the maturity of your program and presenting that maturity of the program against different benchmarks that your board would like to see. So for example, in the industry, competitors, et cetera, et cetera, right? But that is more of a holistic view of how the cybersecurity program is doing. And I like to take it one step further and even say, what is the awareness levels of our departments? How well are our departments doing, even working directly with those departments and providing them cybersecurity KPIs that measures how well that they're doing so we can report back to the board and measure it as a measure of time, right? So that's the first one, the routine. The second one will occur, of course, after or during, during, of course, and then routine after um, a, a cybersecurity incident. So I'm careful to say incident and not data breach because not all incidents are data breaches. Right. And that is a determination by usually legal, which is something that we do want to keep it that way. So then it also protects the CISOs from especially being the keepers of the business of the cybersecurity and then also determining because there's a potential conflict of interest there. So that's kind of why we have that separated in not all companies, but in most. When you're reporting on the incident, essentially, you need to give to the board as much information as you possibly have at that time and continually report that information so they can make any decisions that they need to make at that time. Uh, one of the soft skills for the new world, world size, though, we need to also remember is not all members of the board are cybersecurity experts or even tech experts. So you might have to lower the level and meet your board members where they're at. That's not a terrible thing that they don't know tech, right? They might be experts in finance, in something else. But you need to make sure that every single person sitting on that board who is going to make a decision on the information that you're presenting to them have the requisite base knowledge to make that decision. So this is so so I like that. So you're saying actually it's the move to making sure that they communicate also across the organization. It's not just the, the specific reporting there. And Ira, if you can weigh in also, uh, you, you talk a lot about the justification of uh, investments, uh, required investments. You mentioned it also earlier. But if you think of specifically what you report to the board and when you want to justify a, a budget investment or specific um, need that, that a CISO has. So you often say uh, CISOs um, need to, uh, to communicate what they need versus what they deserve. Um, and so can you a bit elaborate on that and what you mean by, by need so and deserve? So basically, um, there's, you know, I always tell, like, sometimes when I'm at lunches with CISOs, I, I, I think, what a bunch of losers. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I'm sitting around there. It's like, well, I, you know, I made a good justification for my budget. I think I'm going to get it, you know, whatever. And I'm like, that's such a loser attitude. Because here's how... I represents to the board. You go to the board and you say, look, here is the budget I need. Here's specifically why I need it. Here's the amount of risk that is incurred. Here's the amount of risk I'm going to mitigate. Here's the amount of risk that's going to remain. If I get more money, I could probably mitigate some risk, but based on what I think is a reasonable budget, here's the risks I can mitigate. If you don't give me the budget, you know, because that's the thing. What happens when you don't, you shouldn't hope. You should be like, I made a strong business case for what I think we need. Mm -hmm. And based on that business case, if they say, well, well, we're, well, we don't have all that money, we'll give you this. Then you go up to them and say, look, okay, that's your prerogative. But if you don't give me this extra $10 million, I'm just making this up. You, you know, you say, look, that extra 10 million you're going to cut from my budget is going to increase our exposure by two hundred seventy eight point five million dollars. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go ahead and incur two hundred seventy eight point five million dollar extra risk, that is your privilege. I am here to advise and tell you why I ask for the budget that I want 
how I'm going to get, what I'm going to do with that budget and what's going to be the return on investment. And what do I say? Yeah. For- so as, our, as you just said, uh, it's a business conversation. It's a business risk conversation. Exactly. And it's so important that the, the, you know, the security CISO or equivalent has that ability to have that that business conversation because you don't know what you know companies are in different shapes at different times they have so money they can spend money that they can't they have a risk tolerance which is higher or lower so there are so many factors that go into a a, a decision that it's not a simple oh they didn't get my money because I didn't right but but um, the idea of what is acceptable risk is often set more from the business than what from the security people. Now there's a you know minimal viable core, right? There's a minimal set that you need to be have done or else it just puts too much risk into into mm-hmm. the mix. Um, but yeah, in general there's subtleties associated with risk and you need to tell that story and you have to be practical, right? Is the is the risk that we're facing acceptable or not? And how do you come about that is often industry, right? It, it, or often explaining it in business terms it, or explaining what the likelihood of an occurrence could be. So it's very important to shift that mindset and then go back to the same idea as whether you're going to make a investment to go into another country. Right? Whether mm-hmm. you're going to make an investment to go into a new product, whether you're going to make a investment in all sorts of areas, right? So it's not unique to security, right? It's the same conversation that you're going to have to invest in a new product area or a new location or other things. Different yeah. factors go into it, but very, very similar conversations should be had, not a yeah, if you don't invest in my budget, we're all going to blow up, right? You know, right. It, it doesn't make sense. Right. But let me just go to the um, Tim's point, though, because there's a big distinction we need to make. Currently, a COO, if they want to decide where, if they're going to go into different regions or something, that they have data, they have the science behind it. A CFO, if they want to go ahead and do certain things, they have decision support systems. One of the major lackings, and yeah, I'm with Cy, so I'm biased on this, I must admit, is that the CISOs typically don't have the decision support tools to make the business cases as much as they should. They basically are using cybersecurity. I use the concept of art versus science. They're going in, they're looking at budgets, thinking, okay, I have this, I kind of need that, I should need that but they don't have the decision support tools, which, you know, you could call whatever you want, whether you want to call it AI tools, whatever, machine learning, give or take, you know, they need decision support tools to help them put numbers into actions. Like a countermeasure is going to provide a given return on investment. If your budget is reduced by a certain size, what is the actual risk? You know, because a lot of CISOs, frankly, ask for budgets, but if they get their budget reduced, they honestly don't know. And I'm not blaming them because this is how it's typically been done, but they don't have the tools behind them to say, if I don't get that budget, it's going to be this. It's kind of like, well, I really would like the budget because I really think it might impact risk. So we need when you're talking about the new skill, the new CISO or whatever we're calling this webinar, new CISOs, if they want to do their job right, need the actual correct decision support tools or engage a decision science team behind them. Move move away from feelings to facts. Exactly. Yeah. Bring the business case. So moving on to the next the next slide, when we think of, and if you can give maybe an example of one unique ask that you each received from your board of directors that 
you know, represents, I assume, the diversity. And Ira, you, you touched a bit about it right in the beginning of the webinar about this diversity between the different requirements that, that boards have and how they uh, translate the different regulations and rules differently. So if you think of the one unique ask uh, that you each got from uh, the board of directors that you that sticks with you, well, uh, I'm not, there, there, you, I can go to some weird ones, but I let me go to an important one because yeah. what a good CISO should do is regularly engage board members, not at the board, but they should be talking to them once a quarter before board meetings and understand what's important. Yes, you have a few board members who can be clueless, but in general, depending on the size of the organization, most of them are pretty intelligent. And what they're going to want to do is they, they are going to have their pet projects. I don't want to call it a peeve, but a pet project. And they're going to ask you, how can cybersecurity impact this project? And if you could help them with that project that's important to them, whether it's going into a new geographic region, whether it's going into like a new line of business or something like that, that's going to be where you show the most promise to the organization and where you're going to get the support. And each one, what's important to one might not be important to the rest, but you need to understand when they have a pet project, make sure you deep dive into that pet project. And I'll leave it there for now. Got it. Sophia, would you like to go next? Yeah, Ira, I really like that one. I really like that one. Um, for me, I will keep it a little bit more legal. Um, I kid a lot of the time, can we just comply with this one law and then that covers the rest of the laws, right? Thinking specifically GDPR, if we comply with GDPR and now DORA, that'll cover the rest, right? And I'm just here to tell you right now, no, that's not how it works. And the pet project has actually helped me out a lot of sitting down and saying, okay, well, what markets do you want to go into? Let's look at the laws that we're going to be coming into. And how can we position your product, position your idea in the beginning, in the design phase for success? Love that. Tim, would you like to go next? Sure. So, um, you know, I think one of the common things that we see are questions around, you know, how the threat environment is evolving and how much risk we face because of the evolution of the threat environment. That's one that is often asked simply because it changes so quickly. Um, so good question from them. Um, one of the unique ones that I really like is the question of, so how do you attack us? And then what mitigations do we have in place for it? Because the expectation is that, you know, you're, you're the, you know, the head of security for the company. Therefore, you should know what attackers would do, right? And now and you have insight into the internal system. So use your expertise because that's not the board's expertise to give them some insight onto, you know, how would you do it? Right. So that that's always a fun question. As I said, you know, really brings it home as far as if you had the knowledge, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So looking now into 2025, we are about uh, to end this quarter and enter into a new a new year. If I could give each and every one of you just a, you know, a quick word to say, what is the one? You know, the one uh, key insight that you have that will impact uh, the new world CISO most in 2025. And Tim, would you like to start us off? Sure. I, I see that we're really at an inflection point. Right? It's what, like what we talked about earlier is that yeah, 2024 has been, 2023, 2024 started to be a regular regulation year. Um, 25 is when we'll figure out kind of what other rules might be in place and what it means. Um, and I think that 
during that inflection and maturity and, and a place for the CISO role to mature. I think we have an opportunity to mature and, or an opportunity to just stay in the background. And I think many are embracing it and really are going through a maturity step and becoming more integral part of the company with the mm-hmm. skills that are necessary to do that. So I think 2025 and the new new world CISO really is that maturing of the role, role maturing of the people, upskilling of people, um, and you know, basically more more attention paid to you know, cyber across the board. A big uh, a big development. Sophia, would you like to go next? Yeah, if I look into my crystal ball here, um, I would definitely say 2025 is going to be a year of a lot of change. So our new world CISOs need to be prepared to pivot and pivot quickly, depending on the needs of the business, depending on the needs of regulatory, but of course, staying true to the original tenets of cybersecurity and information security, which is protecting and securing data. And how do you do that while making everyone else happy? Well, like Tim said, we will see. <laughs> Let's see, Ira, what do you th- what do you say? I'm gonna have a bit more of a pessimistic view. I'm gonna <laughs> go ahead and pretty much I'm gonna say it's gonna be a bit of the same, but in most of the same, but a little different. And what because the reality is that Companies that have previously looked at cybersecurity as an afterthought are not going to have, you know, the proverbial come to Jesus moment. They are going to go ahead and they're going to look at a new regulation as just one of new regulations. I think what should, however, happen is that if you are a CISO of a public company with regard to SEC type of rules, you need to understand what are your responsibilities and how to cover your behind as best you can. And there are new rules coming into play. If you are involved in a multinational organization and depending like if you're in finance in the European region, you're going to be impacted by DORA as an example, and you need to pay attention to this. But let's be honest, we've had regulations coming and going for the last decade with regard to cybersecurity. It's not like, oh, my God, there's this one new regulation that's going to change the world. It's an incremental change. It's going to be a new form of compliance and new check boxes that you have to go through. Like Sophia said, you're going to have new things come in play and you're going to have to know how these things are impacting you. Like, you know, can you, it's like, no, you're going to have a new checklist or develop a master checklist and now say, okay, I have these regulations. Where's the overlap? You know, and now what do I have to add that's not in the overlap? And that's for your, you know, well, depending on the size of your organization, you probably have a good GRC team already in place that handles a lot of this. Like a, a CISO has to be prepared to be able to show documentation that they did everything right. A CISO has to be prepared to say, look, I went ahead and if they put something on the website, here's what I gave them. I didn't tell them that we are like the bestest organization in the world or whatever, that we are immune from all incidents. You know, I told them we have this in play and you need to just double check and protect yourself because unfortunately the SEC The SEC doesn't broadly go after people. That's a critical thing to understand. The SEC makes examples of people because they have a limited number of prosecutors and they try to go in and go after people or organizations that they think will have the most impact to the rest of the industry, like will send a message. And in sending a message, you want to make sure, look, if they send a message, it's not going to be on me. And why is it not going to be on me? Because I did the best I could and documented everything 
and there's nothing in here that violates any law as far as a reasonable person can tell. You know, yeah. I'll leave it there for now. So if I sum up the way uh, the three of you actually talked about 2025, um, Tim, you mentioned about the maturity and maturing of the role, maturing of the people. With that, Sophia, you mentioned the fact that there will be a need to also pivot and pivot quickly to make changes. In you, Ira, you say, look, you've got to think of how you take all those new regulations and new rules, because they'll they'll just carry on building more, or creating more rules and publishing more rules. But you as a CISO, you need to think of, you know, how how do you prepare ahead of time to this evolution that will just carry on uh, creating more and more rules and regulations with different, you know, documentation and processes, etc. So it's not cybersecurity as an afterthought. It's not regulation as an afterthought. It's already in your day to day, making sure you put in the processes and the um, requirements that you'll need to report on uh, when the day comes. So I'd like to, first of all, you know, thank you so much uh, for, for this open conversation. This is, uh, we, we reached the end of, of our conversation today. And I wanted to say thank you so much for uh, for being open and transparent and um, and share your thoughts and experiences with us. We talked about the new world CISO, how the uh, skill sets and requirements are, are growing, uh, the new regulations and new rules that pose opportunities, but also a lot of challenges that require the new world CISOs to prepare better um, into um, as, as we enter 2025. So, just to also let uh, everybody know, the, um, all your uh, listeners, thank you for joining us. All the questions that you uh, put here on the side, we will answer uh, following uh, in the next following um, uh, days. And we thank you for the attention and engagement. And thank you, my distinguished panel members. And I wish you a very happy holiday season and a very uh, fruitful and successful 2025. Thank you.